I guess most of us agree on this proposition. <laughs> Within two hours, a vast majority of the present guests will be standing at the bar doing exactly what this house believes in. We think in English, in combination with the word drugs, we should ask ourselves, are we misusing legal substances? And here we can think uh, about the misuse of Ritalin by students or a similar case with Viagra. Uh, the way we understand this proposition is that there are risks in taking drugs, uh, drugs. But we're only talking about illegal substances. For instance, we founded Micrologics in 1994. We could do that because it was legal. And when it's legal, you can give the proper information. To our knowledge, in the past 20 years that we work, uh, no one died of the use of truffles. Of course, there were incidents. And maybe you, have the, you had a bad trip. But it's a life experience. Now, by giving potential consumers, uh, consumers adequate information in the booklet, uh, which we give to all the consumers, in nine languages with the do's and don'ts, and by packing the harmless, uh, by packing the truffles in harmless dosages, and of course the correct set and setting, it's hardly possible to be at risk. In 2013, there were only five registered uh, incidents with magic truffles involved, which is quite acceptable if you compare it to horseback. We know riding. that the main psychoactive constituent of cannabis is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol or THC, and we know how THC affects the brain. It binds to just one particular protein in our brain. It's called the CB1 cannabinoid receptor, or cannabinoid receptor. And then you pose the question, well, why does the brain have cannabinoid receptors? There are present within our brains endogenous cannabinoids, endocannabinoids, that are the natural activators of these receptors. We've traced the origins of the cannabinoid system, and we now know that it can be traced back half a billion years long before cannabis was around on Earth. In fact, we can find cannabinoid receptors in marine animals like sea squirts. I don't think you'll see sea squirts uh, popping on a spliff in the oceans. <laughs> uh, so drugs are interacting with very ancient chemical signaling systems in our brains. And those chemical signaling systems have been shaped by millions or hundreds of millions of years of uh, natural selection. So then you might ask the question, well, would you want to mess with a system that's so exquisitely designed and shaped by that length of time in the evolutionary process? I would suggest that being human actually is in itself a pretty psychedelic experience. You don't really need uh, drugs to feel psychedelic experience. So I think one way to look at drugs and drug use is to think about the chemical systems in our brains that these drugs are interacting with and to think about the natural mechanisms that operate in our brains, and to think about what I like to call the drugs from within. We all have drugs from within, those endogenous chemicals that are activating the receptor proteins that the drugs are interacting with. And of course, those drugs from within are being naturally released all the time in our everyday existence. And I would argue that the challenge for us as humans is to find ways of releasing those chemicals as much as we can. For most pleasure. people, recreational drug use is not a source of distress or harm. Most people who use drugs will use them with no serious adverse consequences and will also derive enjoyment and pleasure. The Global Drug Survey of 2014, uh, with its 80,000 drug using respondents in a number of countries, including thousands in the UK, showed that most drug users took some measures to reduce the risks of harm. Now, the same survey, the Global Drug Survey, for example, which is one scientific research I mentioned, developed what is called, something is called the uh, Net Pleasure Index, with the specific aims of exploring the balances of positives and negatives of the different drugs from the perspective of the user. The rated LSD, ecstasy and LSD, has been on balance the most pleasurable drugs with the least effects and alcohol and tobacco as the worst. Now, importantly <laughs> as well in the survey is that respondents were also identified whether adopting harm reduction strategies increased the pleasure of drugs, decreased the pleasure of drugs, and or made absolutely no effect. 
And it's very significant that most respondents of the survey, and as I said, it's a very large survey, viewed safer drug use as in more enjoyable drug use. Now, one of the, one of the sort of groups of factors that increase the risk are sort of factors that are related to the individual themselves. For example, young people, the use of drugs by young people is high risk because the use of psychoactive substances does affect brain development and the development of other organs. And I personally do not like the concept of a drug being recreational or not. I do not think that there are drugs that are intrin intrinsically recreational because one man's recreation is another, or one woman's recreation is another person's poison. The problem can be the pattern of drug use which can be harmful, even if the drug itself is not typically linked to adverse Mr. Effects. President, sitting through the proposition speeches tonight, I think you'll all agree that taking drugs is not only worth the risk, it's essential just to get through the night. Um, the, question for me, the question for me, though, going back, is not really whether you, should be, uh, whether you should take drugs or not. The question is whether you should use up your allowance of risk. And what do I mean by allowance of risk? It's pretty simple. I believe in God. But sadly, I don't think he likes me enough to give me a free pass every time I do something dumb or just plain risky. If I climb too many tall mountains, if I swim too many deep rivers, if I visit a lot of war-torn countries, and I sleep with a lot of the wrong people, sometime something's going to go wrong. Hopefully it won't be too bad, but then again, it might be. Indeed, it might be. So what does that mean? Should I stay home and watch Neighbours twice a day? just in case I miss something the first time? Should I read the mail for the latest advice on which vegetables guaranteed to give me bird flu? <laughs> Not at all. But it does mean I need to think about which risks I want to take and which I can happily set aside. And here's the rub. Risk is too important to be wasted on drugs. Risk is everything. So don't kid yourself that taking drugs is a real risk, one that matters. A bad trip is not a life experience. Taking drugs is the safest, most boring, most stultifying way to use up that most precious of quantities you have, your capacity. What I want to do is talk about people rather than drugs. Yeah, drugs don't have problems, people have problems. And the reason I'm proposing this motion is for you, there isn't a lot of risk. The reality is you will use less dangerous drugs in less dangerous ways. You'll get fun out of it. Three million of, of you will do it this year, and the number you'll get into serious problems is minimal. For you, the risk is worth it. You will calibrate the risk, you will manage it, and it'll be okay. So why, yeah, why have I committed my working life to working with people who've got addiction and who've got problems? Why do I actually believe that we shouldn't legalise drugs? because you aren't normal, because you aren't the whole of the story. There's three million people who use drugs on a fairly regular basis and do all right. There's 300,000 who are addicted to heroin and crack cocaine. 40 or 50,000 who are addicted to, believe it or not, cannabis, powder cocaine, amphetamines, etc. They are not a subset of the three million. The 300,000 addicts look very different to the three million regular users. The three million regular users look, look like the rest of society. They are indistinguishable from a normal subset of the population. They're a, bit, they're a lot younger, they're slightly less likely to be black, they're slightly more likely to be gay, but generally speaking, they're much the same. The 300,000 addicts are male, working class, they've been through the care system, they've failed in education, they've been in and out of prison, they've got fragile mental health problems. Their experience where their, their, their uh, lack of education, their poverty, the poor parenting that they've experienced, their, their lack of income, their criminality, actually preceded their drug use, and in many ways is what's caused it, that is airbrushed out. The very small fraction of you who will get into problems and not been able to get out of them that is the dominant cultural narrative about drug use. Because the people who commission programmes for the BBC, the people who write novels, the people who make films, the people who pass laws, they're more like you 
than they are the people who are on methadone spritz up and down this country. So your atypical experience of drug use is actually the experience that dominates our, our national conversation. I about bet drugs. you, you are not going to risk your career by being photographed taking drugs. You're not. In fact, the Prime Minister didn't want to risk his career by having, him, having pictures of him stood in a 300 pound suit associated with smacking restaurants. She got in the van, right? Let me cut the long story short. Two days later, they found her body. It didn't look good. Didn't look good. Right? Who's it going to be you? Or you? Or you? You know that. Even if you've done the higher degree in metaphysics, do you know that? Is it going to be you? Is it really? Could it be you? I've seen 15 year olds talk better than a drink. Little girl, plucked out of yellow. You think when they have that last bottle of vodka, they talk to you more than they do me. You see, the problem with risk is that it assumes we're all rational and that every decision we make is calculated. So it all works out. It's all laid out before you, isn't it? That's why you're not going to take drugs, by the way. But you don't know. You've got no idea. You've got no idea when you go to the bar tonight and you have a drink, whether it'll be your last. You hope that it won't be. You read the stats. You know that everyone else is drinking for the bar. If you can walk out okay. someone else flattering me. Much has been said and written about the risks of psychoactive substances. Increasingly, one also reads about the medical benefits. In this piece, I would like to focus on what you might term as the spiritual or existential benefit. Myth is the form in which I try to answer when children ask me those fundamental metaphysical questions which, so, which come so readily to their minds. Where did the world come from? Why did God make the world? Where was I before I was born? Where do people go when they die? Again and again, I found they seem to be satisfied with a simple and very ancient story, which goes something like this. God likes to play hide and seek, but because there is nothing outside God, he has no one but himself to play with. He gets over this difficulty by pretending that he is not himself. This is his way of hiding from himself. He pretends that he is you and I and all the people in the world, all the animals, all the plants, all the rocks, and all the stars. God is the self of the world, but you can't see God for the same reason that, without a mirror, you can't see your own eyes, and you certainly can't bite your own teeth or look inside your own head. You may ask why God sometimes hides in the form of horrible people or pretends to be people who suffer great disease and pain. Remember, first, that he isn't really doing this to anyone but himself. Remember, too, that in almost all the stories you enjoy, there have to be bad people, as well as good people, for the thrill of the tale is to find out how the good people will get the better of the bad. The secret which this story slips over is that God, the ultimate ground of being, is you. Not, of course, the everyday you, which the ground is assuming or pretending to be, but that innermost self which escapes inspection because it's always the inspector. This, then, is the taboo of taboos. You're it. The next question we might ask, then, is how can one experience this unity, this sense of non-separation? There are innumerable recipes for this project, almost all of which have something to recommend them. There are the practices of yoga, meditation, dervish dancing, psychotherapy, Zen Buddhism, Ignatian, Salesian, and Heishart methods of prayer, psychodrama, group dynamics, sensory awareness techniques, Quakerism, Gurdjieff exercises, relaxation therapies, the Alexander Method, 
autogenic training, self-hypnosis, and the use of consciousness-changing chemicals, such as LSD and mescaline. And there we have it. The reason why I believe psychedelics are certainly worth the risk for large numbers of people is that they are a tool, amongst several, for awakening to the true nature right, of being. Right, Mint, this is just a little bit of an experiment. Please, Mr. President, uh, allow me to do a family experiment. We, I don't know anybody here whether you're a soft mint family or a hard mint family. You'll have seen the advertisement. And you'll notice here, just to let you know on risk, that on the hard mints, it says here that allergy advice may contain traces of nuts. If anybody here is allergic to nuts, you mustn't take the hard mints, okay? But what's going to happen is, and these are the soft mints, by the way, if there's anyone here who's under four, <laughs> <laughs> they're not suitable for you because it's a choking hazard, okay? So, if I can just give this side... Uh, please, the two mints. And then what I want, the, the, the purpose of this experiment is, which one is eaten first? Where are we on the mints, by the way? I hope they haven't. Where, where are we? Uh, this side? What, what, can somebody announce the winner? Sorry, the soft mints have run out. What about this side? Not yet. So, so, so who's winning at the minute? Are, are you more of a hard mint? <laughs> I think we can safely assume that the soft mints are the most popular. Well, that's a pity, because down my underpants, I've actually got two hard mints. <laughs> and I was hoping that, that you'd quite like these. So I was wondering, if I were to put them in a glass, um, if any, would anybody like a, a hard mint? <laughs> Nobody? Nobody? They've only been down my underpants. They, they, they came out of the same packet that you've been eating from. Well, if I were to, let's say, I were to reduce the risk. So, in my pocket, I have the same packet. I'm now, I'm, I'm now going to have to change hands, because this is a contaminant of hand, of course. And I'm now going to put two hard mints into here. Anybody want to take the risk? Anybody want to take the risk? Put your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've now got four interesting little white tablets in my pocket. I'm going to put them in this glass. I think these are nice tablets. Anybody want to join me? Who wants to join me with a white tablet? Listen, folks, you didn't take any of those tablets and you were not very keen at eating those mints that had been down my trousers. <laughs> Should I tell you, we, use, we have a three-second rule in our house. If the food lands on the floor and you can pick it up within three seconds, it's edible. D does anybody else have that rule? Okay. Well, the rule in prison is the ten-minute rule. If it's been up somebody's rectum for less than 10 minutes, it's edible. I rest my case.